today, I'm not just going to talk, but we're going to pray, and there's going to be an anointing today, and I want you to get your expectation that some things are going to come to an end. I want you to think about that. What, what has been going on in your life that needs to end? I'm not talking about things that you, you could end, because if you could have, you would have. I'm not talking about you need to get more willpower and you need to get more determination. No, no, no. I'm talking about a supernatural. I got to have some help here. I've got negativity. I've got destructive behavior. I, I, I got stuff going on that I know is not right, but I can't stop it. I need some supernatural help today. I want you to trust God's word. And I want you to get it out there while I'm talking to you. What needs to end? And then we're going to watch God do a supernatural ending. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the end is just the beginning. Let's read our text here. Open your Bibles anywhere. I'm going to cover it all. Our text is found in Isaiah chapter 10, 23. Thank you for remaining standing. And those of you at home, would you please stand on your couch there? Isaiah 10, 23 through 27. The Lord of hosts will make a determined end. Say with me, please, a determined end. God, what a great crowd here today. Man, I'm so proud of you all. God says, I will make a determined end In the midst of the land, thus says the Lord of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, don't be afraid of the enemy. Oh, he will strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you. For yet a little while, and the indignation will cease. It will end, as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge, a whip, a rod of punishment for him, the enemy, like the slaughter of Median at the rock of Oreb. That's Isaiah reminding them of Gideon's victory of the 300. Yes. And this is our text here. The determined end that the burden of the enemy will be taken away from your shoulder and the enemy's yoke off of your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. That yoke that has been on your neck, that burden that has been on your heart that junk that stuff that's been messing with you is going to be broken today not by your might not by your power but supernaturally hmm Christ will be that supernatural ending. Here's another scripture I'd like to read while you're standing. Thank you for standing. Then he said to me, this is John writing in the Revelation 21.6. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. Here's what I want you to get. God is the A to Z. God is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. I know you believe he's a beginning because he gave you a new beginning. But I don't think you know that he is also the end. Meaning, just like he started the new life, he can in the junk in your life today and he's very much intending to do it today somebody give God praise
And then one last verse, Deuteronomy 8, 16. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good in the end. Father, I thank you for the anointing that's in this building. I thank you for the anointing that's literally all around the world touching us in this moment. Thank you. The end is coming. The end is coming to the pain, to the hurt, to the misunderstanding, to the burden, to the yoke of the enemy. In Jesus' name, look, by, look at somebody and say, the end is just the beginning. Come on, before you're seated, the end is just the beginning. Wow. Amen. You may be seated. The end is just the beginning. Give it up for our musicians, all of our team, our staff. Give them a big hand clap, everybody. This is beautiful, anointed stuff here. Right before I get started, I'm so proud of the staff and all of our pastors here at One Church LA and Denver. You know, for a pastor to be this gone this long, being restored and being prepared, and the church not missing a beat is a great tribute to the leadership and to you. Give yourself a big hand clap. That's fantastic. So the word of the Lord to you today is the end. The end is just the beginning. It's an understanding that before a beginning can happen in your life, something has to end. This is the pattern. Something ends and then a new beginning. So the end is not something to be discouraged about. In fact, for many of us, we have been longing, wrestling with, coming to terms with what needs to come to the end in our lives. And before we start the new year, we don't want to go in one year and out the other year without some substantial endings. Don't want to drag in this year's mess. Don't want to drag in this past year's hurt, pain, misunderstanding. I want the new wine. Jesus said, look, I, I don't want to blow your mind and give you new wine and blow your mind and lose what I'm doing. That's a paraphrase of saying you don't put new wine in old wineskin. Because why? Because the old wineskin burst, you lose both. So God is saying, I want to do a new thing, but you're going to have to deal with the old stuff. And I'm here to help you, says the Lord. And, and, and new is romantic, but it cost a letting go to do it. In fact, Jesus said this about new wine. He said, many will say, I like the old better than the new. I'm familiar with it. And, and Jesus said, you got to learn that new wine is an acquired taste. See, I know when I'm up here preaching, I know that you guys are all just saying, yeah, yeah, I want the end, I want the end. But I know that why I'm preaching, the Holy Spirit is going to have to work because some of us are comfortable doing the same old thing over and over, even though we don't like the results. It's just something that we do. You know, back in the old days before they had sophisticated testing, when people were crazy, they'd lock them up. And then if they thought they were getting better, they had a, a little test. They'd put them in a room, turn the water faucet on, give them a bucket and a mop. And if they mopped and mopped and never turned off the water, they took them back to their room. Sila, today, there is going to be an end to relationships that are unequally yoked, abusive. They're not helping you. You're not getting anywhere in this. There's going to be an end to activities and things that you do that are bearing no fruit. And though you have become familiar and comfortable, the end. I have three phenomenal grandchildren, and grandchildren are God's reward for you not killing your kids. And I love them. 
one of the things we do is we tell stories. And when I retire from pastoring, which will never be, I want to be an actor. I love to tell stories. I love to act. I'm going to do that in, in the millennium. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I love to tell stories. And my grandkids, Peyton and Colin, they're the same personality, and they love to act, and we act out the story. Declan, he's pretty cool. Of course, he's older now. In fact, Declan, my grandson, wears my same size shoe. We share the same shoe. He comes over my house, takes all my shoes. But back when he was a young man, he would, he, his, his goal was he had a part to play. He didn't do all the drama stuff. But he loved to do his part, and he couldn't wait to do his part. And so we're doing all this stuff, doing all this. And he'd say, now, Papa, now, can I do my part? No, not yet. And then we'd just keep acting, and we'd keep telling the story. And then, Papa, now, can I? Now, can I do my part? No. And then finally, when we exhausted all of our imagination and storytelling, we finally give and say, okay, Declan, your turn. The end. I'm playing Declan today. I'm saying. And this is important to understand that God is determined to end, but now needs you and I to step up to that place where we are willing to say, before an open door is always a closed door. And God will always close a door before he opens another one. Because he's not going to let you hang on to one while he's opening up another. So closed doors are celebrated. Closed doors are just a sign that God is about to open a new door. When a closed door happens, you need to rejoice. When a door is closing, get your feet back. Get your fingers back. Get your feelings back. And let God, and know the difference between rejection and protection. Know the difference between an exit and the next it. And that comes through an understanding of embracing the end. This is going to end. In the Jewish tradition and even scriptures, there was a very strong teaching of putting an end in death. The Jews were required to bury the body quickly. It was not to go more than two days. It didn't matter. The relatives weren't, it didn't matter. There was a command. In fact, the scripture says, in haste, they are to return back to the dirt from which they came from. This was to happen quickly. Number two, it was to begin the restoration, the the grief and the healing so that they could move on to the next quicker and not let it be stretched out and delayed. And in fact, they would be put in a cave or they would be put in a place quickly And then after a year, when it would be nothing but bones, that's when they would actually bury the bones. That's why when Jesus said to the man, he said, follow me. I got something new for you. And he said, I need to bury my father. And God said, Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. He wasn't saying don't go to the funeral. He was saying that's over. It's now a matter of taking his bones and now burying those. So I'm telling you, the mindset of God is we're done here. It's over. We're not going to drag this thing out. I need you to come to a determined end. And this was something that history records a story in 135 AD where the Romans were crushing the Jews and trying to not only destroy them but intimidate them and break down their morale. Just outside of Jerusalem was a fierce war and thousands of warriors from the, from the Jews were slaughtered. But the Roman tacticians had strategized something more than just winning and killing all of the soldiers. But they required that their bodies would be left out. 
and tens of thousands of soldiers, their bodies were laid out. It, it was to intimidate. It was to remind them. It was to drag the whole thing out, which was the worst thing you could have ever done. Today, I want to tell you, there's an urgency before Tuesday night, if you will. There's an urgency to the calendar of your own life that says, we're not going to drag this thing out. We're not going to try to make there's no clever arrangement of rotten eggs that can make a good omelet. It's time to turn the water faucet out and then get the mop and bucket. You can't do the same thing over and over and expect different results. If pastor's going to release the year, the year of revealing, we need to get some dealing and some healing done. The end. Even in Deuteronomy, you can see when he said, I, I want you to ultimately see that I'm going to test you and I'm going to humble you so that you can see the good at the end of what I'm doing. This is how serious God is for putting a period to putting an end. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had had 400 years of a mindset that they were nobodies, that they were just nothing but told what to do. They had no sense of value. No one ever told them to go for their dreams. Nobody had ever told them that they could be all they could be. No one ever told them they were children of the Most High God. They were told they were nobodies. They were beaten. They were controlled. They were totally brought under the will of others. And when God brought them out of Egypt and, and, and before he could bring them into the promised land, they were only two weeks away on foot. But it took 40 years to do what? To get the old generation died off because God did not want that mentality coming in to the promised land that he had prepared for them. Can I tell you that God is saying, how many laps are you wanting to take because you're not coming into your new until you're willing to let the old die. It's time to put the end on what you've been going through. It's time for the end. This I learned when God was calling me into a transition seven years ago. Gene and I started a church, and I thought I would die preaching to that church, that I would preach a sermon, probably fall over, carry me out, and that would be it. But God had bigger and better things, but I couldn't get it in my mind. I couldn't figure it out. And so the brook started drying up and, and doors started closing. And the same effort that I was putting in and seeing success, now it was taking twice the effort to have half the success. And I kept banging against the, the, the brass heavens. God, what are you saying? And finally, God said to me, you need to understand, Phil, I am the beginning, but I'm also the end, and we are done here. We are done. Oh, no, we can't be done because quitters never win and winners never quit and because your word says that, but I looked it up, and it's not in the Bible. I thought, man, King James missed it. I Googled it. Vince Lombardi said that. Life isn't an NFL football game. And there will be times when God says, we are done here. This season is over. But I don't want to be a quitter. Oh, quitters never win. Oh, yeah, they do. Winners quit the right thing at the right time for the right reason. And tonight, today, I'm giving you the right to say, if it's not bearing fruit, if it doesn't have favor, we're done here. We've all heard stories, tragic stories, of people that have ended their lives. I, I've had ministers this past year took their life. First of all, I want to say to you that if you have serious, consistent struggles with suicide or taking your life, please, there's no shame. Get help. Let somebody help you walk yourself through this. See, if you have kidney problems... Go to the doctor. Doctors know what to do to get your kidneys back in shape. 
If you have heart problems, go to a doctor. There's no crime. There's no lack of faith in that. Let a doctor tell you what you need to do to get your heart back on track. The brain is an organ. There are things that can happen to you. The change of life, chemistry imbalance, different things that can happen. So if you have these, don't be afraid to get help. Please get help. And, and, and if it helps, I go through those times. I have those dark moments where I lay in bed and I just think, you know what? I don't like my life. I feel disappointed. Always during Christmas time, I battle. It's like I'm coming to the end of the year and I don't like what my year looked like. I came short of what I wanted. I go dark and I've got to fight that. But here's what I thought. How many good people have gone to the extreme and ended their life when there could have been an alternative to back up and end things in their life that drove them there? Why can't we be just as deliberate and just as desperate to say, this is not working and I'm not going to do this anymore. The end. To end your marriage? End some of the behavior that's ruining your marriage. Don't be so drastic. I mean, Jeannie and I are going on our 43rd year of marriage. And I often say this, you know, not to the same woman. Because she's been about seven or eight different women. I fall out of love with them and, and fall in love with the new one. I got the best version of her right now. It's sweet, sweet. She's not here and she doesn't have the mic, so we'll just have to let her opinion just. But I don't know if it was wisdom or if it was uh, weariness. But at some point, I just got tired of us fighting, stressing each other out, ruining vacations, ruining date night. I just got tired of it. I thought, are we going to do this all the time? And the whole thing was over the fact that who's right? Well, I did a math. I did some math, and I realized I'm fighting over me being right. And I had enough experience to realize that I wasn't always right. So I thought, okay, if I'm not always right, why am I always fighting to be right? Number two, I thought, not only am I not always right, but sometimes there's more right. There's more ways to be right than one. And then thirdly, I came to the conclusion, do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? So I thought, okay, the end, because number one, I'm not always right. Number two, there's always another way to be right. And number three, I'm tired of not being happy. The end. I just came to peace that I'm not going to fight about everything. I'm just not going to. I'm going to just recognize that she's probably right. And if she's not right, one of her ways of being right will work. Unity over one idea is better than disunity over two great ideas. And I'm a lot happier. The end. How long are you going to be miserable until something comes to The end. I'm not going to let my life go off the cliff. I'm going to back up and I'm going to say, yes, this career's not working. Yep, this, this agent is not right. This relationship, and I'm not talking about marriage, but this relationship isn't going anywhere. Not a pipe, not a move when I say that. <laughs> this comes to an end. When you come to that place where you come to the end, of things in your life that are not 
producing, that you've pruned it, you've cut it back, but it's not producing. When you come to the place that you recognize that God has so many more things for you and that you're ready to put an end to behavior that is negative, habits that are negative, that you allow yourself to continue to unravel and you say, the end. Let me tell you what will happen when you do that. The first thing you must have is first that desire that I want this to end. And it's good that your will is not involved. There's a time and a place where you need a good will kicking. I'm trying to find the most Christian way of saying that. You need to get your will kicked. Get up and get... But I'm not talking about that today. You see, you didn't become a Christian because you made up your mind you were going to be a Christian. You became a Christian because God supernaturally transformed you. You started acting new because you were new. Are you willing today in the next few moments to say to God, take this, I'm done with it, and allow the supernatural power of God to break that yoke off of you today. Are you willing today to say, done, period, the end? One of the things that you'll come to understand is that the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, that he made us alive in him, we who were dead in our own sins and trespasses. Listen carefully to verse 2. And that we who by disobedience were subject to the course of the world and the prince and power of the air. Listen carefully. This is a very important point. You're going to need this, so grasp this. Watch what he said. We were dead in our sins. In other words, we were not alive at all to our possibilities. We were as dead in habitual habits and negativity and going downhill. He quickened us and made us alive and separated us from the past of which was the course, and there's the word, and the power of the air, the course of the world. The word course means a pattern, a habitual pattern of which we were all walking in. In other words, without thinking about it, it was our nature and it was a course, almost like we were programmed and we just did it. Then he made us alive. And when he made us alive, he broke the curse. He broke the curse of sin and death off of our life. Here's where we're stuck. He didn't break the course. He broke the curse. When you got saved, all curses were broken off of your life. Listen carefully. But you need some of them continually are sneaking Slipping in. Second nature is kicked back in. And you need to go and get your receipt from Calvary. And you need to itemize. Am I having to be under the curse of what my parents' behavior was? No. It was paid for at the cross. Am I always going to have a temper? No. That was paid for at the cross. Because there's been these habits in my family for generations. No. But you need to pull that itemized receipt. And you need to begin to say, in the name of Jesus, that curse is now broken. And that yoke is broken. And no the course is not the same thing as the curse. Watch me. When they amputate 
someone's arm as an example, the arm is removed. Clearly, you can look in the mirror, it's gone. I do not have a left arm, they took it away. But your mind has nerves that it's been sending and communicating to that arm all of its life. That doesn't get cut off. You will sometimes, they say, feel itching sensation. You feel like you need to move your arm. There's nothing there. The mind doesn't know it. This is what you have to understand. Today, in the next five minutes, even while I'm talking, when the curse is broken off of you, just because your mind goes there doesn't mean there's anything there. You got to know what I'm preaching today, that the curse has been broken. The end. My mind may go there, but I'm not. Hmm. The mama brought the eight-year-old boy to me at Lakewood Church after I preached one Wednesday night. She said, tell him. He looked down at his feet. He would look up at me. Tell him. Tell him he's good people, she said. He wouldn't look up at me. I got down on my knees. I said, look at me. What's your name? David. David, look at me. You got to talk to me because your mama's not going to let you or me go. <laughs> I said, talk to me. Eight-year-old boy said this to me. Every night when I go take a bath, I don't know why, but I try to drown myself. My heart sank. I said, oh, my God, what do I do? I've never heard. Oh, God. And God gave me a word of knowledge. And I said, David, let me tell you why you don't know why you say those things. Because it's not you. It's the devil impersonating your voice, putting those thoughts in your mind. That is not you. David, the next time you hear that, and then I got him. I, 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 I got to do this. I'm running out of time. But can, can I borrow you, sir? Could you come on up here? Yes, ma'am. Who? Yes. What's your name? Come on. Come here. I can't see with you. What's your name? What's your name? What is it? That's a beautiful name. Okay. You tough? Are you sure? Okay, girl. So David was about your size. I said, that's not you hearing those things. That's not you talking. That's the enemy talking, using your voice. And I went like this. I pushed him. I said, come on back here. I pushed him again. By that time, the security is now circling me. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to tell you now. Honey, I'm going to push you. This time when I do, don't let me. There you go. Come on, a little stronger. Come on. There you go. I said, the next time you get those thoughts, you don't just surrender to them. You resist. Can I tell you, resist, resist. You're going to get those thoughts. You're going to get those same instincts. You're going to still feel like the same person. But you are not. You are not. You are not. The curse is broken. Come on and give God praise, somebody. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Listen. There's anointing in this place. How many feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Something is about to happen. Something is already happening. Oh, somebody praise the name of the Lord. There is, a, there is an anointing breaking, 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 breaking. Stand to your feet. The anointing is here. He's coming right now. Stand to your feet with me right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, come now. I'm not talking about willpower. I'm not talking about discipline. I'm not talking about making up your mind. I'm not talking about a hundred day plan. I'm not talking about fasting and praying until it goes away. I'm talking about in a twinkling of an eye, the anointing is here to break that yoke today, now.
It's not going to be by might. Things like pornography and excessive drinking and anger and temper. Dark behavior. Self-inflicting, sabotaging thoughts about yourself. I'm talking about it going like that. Like that. Like that. You'll pass that channel. You'll pass. Your eyes will stay up right here. And you'll think, my God, I've never all my whole life been like that. That's because the anointing is here. Not you. The anointing is here. To break that yoke. The end. Now you got to know this. It's my last thing here and then I'm going to pray. Listen to me. She was a new convert. And the pastor told her, if the devil ever messes with you, all you got to do is say the name of Jesus. And the Bible says he trembles at the sound of that name. She said, thank you, preacher. A few days later, she went to bed and she had a dream that night. And in that night, a foul thief a foul looking creature came in her home she remembers in the dream coming out of the bedroom and looking over the balcony looking in the living room and making eye contact with this foul demonic thief with a bag around his shoulder taking precious things and putting them in the bag taking precious items and putting the back she remembered the preacher told me to say the name of Jesus to say the name of Jesus and so she looked over the balcony and she said in the name of Jesus I rebuke you get out of my house and put my stuff back the demonic creature looked at her and said I'm not afraid of that name and I don't have to listen to you and I'm taking this stuff with me. She lost her breath. Oh I'm sure he told me this. My pa- he told me this. Maybe I got to say it louder. She leaned over and she said, I'm telling you, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. Get out of my house and put my stuff back. And he looked right back at her and said, I'm not afraid of that name. And I don't have to do anything you tell me. Let me tell you something. The devil is a liar. There's no truth in him. And he can't admit victory when he is defeated because that would mean he's telling the truth and he has no truth in him. She did it again. I say in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. Get out of my house and put my stuff back. He looked back at her and said the same thing. But this time she noticed that he was taking things out of the bag and putting them back where they belong. And as he ran out of the house, he said, I'm not afraid of that name. I don't listen. The devil is a liar. He doesn't have the truth in him. The victory is yours. The victory is yours today. Here it is. The anointing oil. Choke. Breaking. I know it. Now look at me. Before I do this, you got to know the curse will be broken. The course, time. Separate it and don't waver. Number two, the devil will never admit defeat. When we get done praying, don't think for a moment, he's going to say, oh man, you got me today. 
he's a liar. And the only thing he can say is, nothing happened. Because there is no truth in him. Are you hearing me today? Because this is the last time that you will have to deal with that stuff. Get your hands out like this. If you want this. If you don't want this, keep your hands in your pocket. What is it? I have two things. I have something in that hand I'm thinking about right now. It's too personal. I, I'm not going to share it with you. It's between God and I. And I have something in this hand right here. These two things. They're, they're messing with me. They're holding me back. You see, I don't want to die with dreams inside me. I don't want to resent anybody. This is close out, clearance, prices slashed down, no offer refused moment. I don't need an apology. I don't need my story to be told. I'm marking this one as done because I'm done carrying the weight of my anger and my resentment and my jealousy and my anger. I'm done with it. The end. The Bible says Elisha had a double mantle on him. He did miracles, but he went to his grave. And years after he was dead and buried, a soldier was buried accidentally on top of him. And when the shoulder, when the hands and the bones of the dead soldier touched the bones of the prophet, he rose from the dead. Great story, right? Not really. That prophet went to his grave with a miracle still in him. I will not let that happen. I will die empty. Did you hear me? I will die empty. I am not afraid to fail. I will not allow resentment, guilt. I will not die with a miracle. Am I talking to anybody here today? Whatever is in your way, the end, the end, the end. All right, I got them. Put your hands out like this. What's going? My God, I can hardly hold still. What's going? Put it there. Come on. Come on, put your mind right there. What's going? What's going to end? Got it? Got it? Got it? Watch me. Got it? Watch me. Watch me. Eyes on me. Watch me. You got it? Watch. Do what I'm doing right now. Ready? Let it go. 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 go. That battle will never be yours again. Never the end. The mind, the liar, but there's an anointing that has broken that yoke. Your memories, delete, 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 delete. Clear, clear, clear. Erase, 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 erase. Sandreba kamoro misikiri yomoto sasata. Watch me. Keep your hands. They're going. They're going. I just. You're about to turn it. Watch me for a second. About ten years ago, a member of my church, Aniela, was riding a bike or bicycle in the in the valley in Majeska Canyon. A lion who had already killed. A Marine earlier that morning jumped out of the bushes and took her 
head and had his teeth in her helmet and his bottom teeth in her chin. Pulled her into the revere. God miraculously saved her life and I went to the hospital. The Holy Spirit told me to pray for her. I said, Ann, you will never have a nightmare. You will never have a dream. Because all she could see was inside the mouth of that lion. And when I prayed, it has been 12 years, not one dream, not one memory that shakes her, that haunts her. Can I tell you, you better get those hands together. That's what God has done today. He has broken the yoke. Memories. He has broken the yoke. Things you have never been able to walk away from. Come on, you can worship God. Happy New Year. Two days in advance. Come on. Happy New Year. Two days in advance. Woo! Now your hands over your heart. Father, seal this word. And I cannot wait for the people to testify in the weeks and in the months to come that the bite and the sting was removed and that you put an end for the end is really just the beginning. Can you one more time give God great praise right now for his word? Come on.